Good evening, everyone. And thanks for coming. Now we're going to open our service by singing 488. 488, O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. O breath and life, come cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet this hour. That's 488. church with life and power. Oh, renew us and fit your church to meet this hour. Oh, breath of love, come pray in us, renewing thought and will and heart. church in every part. Oh, wind of God, come bend us, break us, till humbly we confess our need. Then in your tenderness remake us, revive, restore for this we plead. Revive us, Lord, is zeal abating, while harvest fields are vast and white. Revive us, Lord, is waiting, equip thy church to spread the light. After singing that lovely hymn, let's ask the Lord to help us tonight in a short prayer. Our Father and our God, it's with thanksgiving that we sing these words. O breath of God, O breath of life, come sweeping through us. And our prayer tonight is that we might know something of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to worship from hearts that have been redeemed by that precious blood. Lord, we pray that as we look into your holy word, that the Spirit of God may guide us and lead us, that we might be an effective church, that we might see men and women becoming changed and saved. Oh Lord, we thank you for your goodness and We thank you for every blessing that we have received in our Lord Jesus. We pray that tonight as we meditate on your word, Lord, that something new and fresh may be there for us to see. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can read it in our own language. And we pray that as we learn more about our blessed Lord that we might become more like him. Father, we think of the world that we're living in and people are so uninterested in the things of God and they're only interested in what affects them. And we just pray that even at this moment people will become God conscious and that they might want to know What happens when life ceases? Lord, hear our prayer and help us to bring the good news to those that we know and those that we don't know that the Lord Jesus may be honoured and exalted in our presence. Lord, hear our prayer. 
Be with us this night. And those who are unable to come, we pray for them sincerely. Father, hear our prayer, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing another hymn, which is number 1818. And it's about the Spirit as he moves in the world. Number 18, all over the world, the Spirit is moving all over the world. As the prophet said it would be all over the world. There's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's our prayer tonight. Number 18. <coughs> the world the spirit is moving all over the world as the prophet said it would be all over the world there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea all over this church the spirit is moving all over his church as the prophet said it would be all over this church there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea Right here in this place, the Spirit is moving. Right here in this place, as the prophet said it would be. Right here in this place, there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Last week we looked at the ascension and the resurrection. And we noticed that Luke was the only writer who gave us the details of the ascension. This is what John said in chapter 16, verse 28. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. That's what John said about the ascension. Now we thought about the journey as they left Jerusalem, the Lord and the 11 disciples, and crossed the Kidron Valley and climbed all of it, which is 200 feet higher than Jerusalem. We also tuned into their conversation because they were asking the Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We spoke about that. Then the benediction that he said, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And we witnessed, or we were there in thought, as the Lord Jesus ascended back to heaven. And these disciples were gazing up into the sky. And when they couldn't see the Lord anymore for the cloud, they discovered there was two angels in white garments standing with them. And said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the sky? This same Jesus, 
will so come in like manner. And we thought about the rapture, how he's coming back again. And they were to witness about the Lord Jesus. What they had seen and what they had witnessed. And one thing we do know, they went back to Jerusalem full of joy for what they had experienced. The risen Lord. And I did say at the end that if somebody said to Peter, we don't believe that Jesus is alive. Well, that place he ascended was in the vicinity of Bethany. And there was a resurrected man in Bethany. And I did mention that the Lord has left us here as resurrected men and women to show to the world that Jesus is alive. We're alive in him. And we can witness to him. Now, one thing we noticed they had to stay in Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father. Now tonight I want just to read from Acts chapter 2 and it's about Pentecost. And I'm going to read it in different sections. So there'll be four readings from Acts chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 1 down to verse 13 in the first reading. Because I feel that what is written in the scripture, well, is more powerful than anything we might say. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit led Luke to write these words. And we're reading from Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, that was they were waiting for the promise of the Father. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this, Sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians? and Medes, and the Elimelites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Ferga, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belong to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabians, We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. Now tonight we're thinking about Pentecost. And these first words that we read said they were all together in one place. A hundred and twenty were in that upper room. And suddenly, unexpectedly, there came from heaven a sound 
like a rushing mighty wind. Now that's what happened in, on the day of Pentecost. Now there were three great Jewish feasts or festivals to which every male Jew within 20 mile radius of Jerusalem was legally bound to come. One was the Passover, another was Pentecost, and the third one was the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we know about the Passover, how that they celebrated the Passover, remembering that they were slaves in Egypt and sheltering under the blood of that slain lamb on that night, God passed over them and they were saved and they celebrated the Passover. They left Egypt to be free and that was the Passover. Then Pentecost, which happened about 50 days later, was the time when Pentecost really means 50th and sometimes it's called the feast of weeks now the Passover fell about the middle of April and Pentecost was 50 days later which was at the beginning of June now Luke tells us that nobody had to work that day it was a holiday and since it was June, more people were able to travel. So there were enormous crowds in Jerusalem. It was an international crowd. There was all the places I read to you where they came from. Pentecost was also when Moses received the law from God on the mountain. And it had an agricultural significance because we read in Leviticus and also in Numbers what happened at that time. Now here was Jerusalem packed with people, Jews and proselytes. Proselytes were Gentiles who had grown tired of the multitude of heathen gods. And they came to the synagogue to learn about the one God. That's why they came. And they learned about a clean way of life because the Jews had the Ten Commandments. Now, I told you that some people in that last verse mocked the disciples and said, these people are full of new, new wine. And Peter and the rest of the disciples who were under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they said, we're not full of new wine. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. And at a festival... They didn't drink or eat before 10 o'clock in the morning. So how could anybody be drunk at that time? Now let's just read a wee bit more. Verse 14. And I'll read down to about verse 41. Verse 14 says, But Peter... Standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Now it says eleven there, and Peter. And the other was Matthias, who was chosen in the upper room before the Holy Spirit came. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give to my words 
For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what the, was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and significant day. And it shall come to pass, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the de definite plan, definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand. I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or, you, or let your Holy One seed corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise holy of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now this is one of the most interesting passages of the whole New Testament because it's an account of the first Christian sermon ever preached. Now the early church had a tremendous sense that Jesus was the hinge of all history. And with his coming, eternity had invaded time. And that 
God had entered the human arena. Now, those critics who were there and said that they were drunk, as we read, I said that at a special festival, people didn't eat or drink before 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, when the Holy Spirit came to that upper room, there was a sound to hear. It was like a rushing, mighty wind. And it was a sight to see. They saw cloven tongues of fire resting on everybody. And it was a time to experience. Now the Bible says tongues as of fire. It wasn't real fire. It was like fire. Now when a person becomes a Christian, they are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Now, two places in our New Testament, it tells us that John said we would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, that was one of the places. And another place says baptized by the Holy Spirit and by fire. Now, when we're speaking to believers, it doesn't speak about fire. It just speaks about being baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I think that baptism by fire is because people are unrepentant. But when we're baptized by the Holy Spirit, we're baptized into one body. But the fire is for those who have never trusted the Lord. Now, when the people in Nimrod's time was building the Tower of Babel, they thought they would build a tower up to heaven. And God came, and he came down and confused their language. And they didn't know what each other were saying. And they went to different parts, and the tower was never finished. On the day of Pentecost, men heard their language, the language in which they were born. So the coming of the Holy Spirit corrected that point. And people heard the wonderful works of God in their own language. That confusion that happened at Babel was rectified because people heard from these different places that we've been speaking about. And all the men were Galileans. They were known languages, not something unknown, not something which is Babel. It was recognized by the people who were from different countries. Now, let's look at another part of this passage. We'll look at the where we stopped. Verse 36. It says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, What shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he 
bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now that's what happened when Peter was preaching. Now here's a passage which is full and very full of the essence of thought. It insisted that the cross was no accident. Verse 23 says this. Over and over again it stated God's plan. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and with the help of wicked men put to death by nailing him to the cross. No wonder they were cut to the heart. This is what Peter said. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God hath made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They cried out, what should we do? We've crucified the anointed one, the Christ. We put him to death. And this is what Peter says. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In his message, he spoke about repentance. Now, we've got to repent. And repentance means a change of mind. Now, lots of people change their mind. But that's not all about repentance. There's more to the repentance than change of mind. We've got to change our action. And when we change our action, repentance comes Something happens to the past. Our sins are removed. The remission of sins. Now that's what happens when a person truly repents. They're changing their mind about what they were doing. And they've changed their actions. They're going a different direction. Instead of going one way. We're going the other. Instead of going to hell, we're going to heaven. Because we're going to go on. And at that moment, this is what Peter says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe that when a person is born again, that moment, the Holy Spirit indwells them. Now, if we read the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people for a certain work. But at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit indwelt people. Now, some people think the Holy Spirit only came at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was there all the time before when we read Genesis, the first few verses, it tells us the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. There he was there. He was there in David's time. He was there in Isaiah's time. And the minor prophets, he was there telling them things. But he came in power. At Pentecost, the promise of the Father, I will send my Spirit to you. So we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. We're a different person. We belong to God. 
few weeks and months ago, I was speaking about being in the family of God. We're in God's divine family. We belong to him. Now Luke tells us how the church began and about the first sermon of the church. Also the results. There were 3,000 people baptized that day. Now that is some day. 3,000. And the next day there was 5,000. The church was really growing. Now tonight I want just to read the last part of this chapter. And it's verse 42 we're reading. And there's only seven verses in this last part. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions, belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And that day, by day, attended the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Now tonight we're going to look at some of the characteristics of the church. First of all, it was a learning church. Now I'm sure you know as well as I do that sometimes people will say, well we've always done it this way. No matter what happens, we've always done it that way. So they don't want to learn. They don't want to change. A few weeks ago, we spoke about things that would happen or changes that we would make. And one thing which stuck in my mind was the idea that we weren't going to change the mode. Now, if we don't change the mode or if we don't change... We're not a learning church. Now, several years ago, I stayed with people in Bristol who were exclusive brethren. And uh, I don't know why I stayed with them, but I stayed with them because I was up that area and they had a beautiful house. I'd never been in a house like it. It was one of those grand designs. And... I imagine it was a square or a rectangle shape because all the rooms were on the ground floor. But inside, in the middle, there was a garden. And you could see the garden through the, the glass as I walked around to different rooms. Now, I had never been in a house like that where you saw the garden, which was... Not really outside, it was inside. And I asked them different things, what they did in their church. Now, they never invited me to go there, but they told me what it was like. They had bricked up all the windows, so there was no daylight in the church. They had a table in the middle, and all the seats went up each side. And in front of each chair was a microphone so that people, if they wanted to say something, would say it to the whole congregation. 
So I asked a few questions like what I do. I said, what time do you have it? And they surprised me. They said, 6 a.m. I said, does anybody come? They said, they're all there. I was six in the morning. I said, why do you have it so early? They said, so that nobody else comes, but the people who are members. So I asked them another few questions. I said, what happens when you meet? They said, well, we have a hymn and a prayer, and sometimes you read the Bible, and then we break the bread right away. I said, and what happens after that? They said, we worship the Lord. And I thought that was a lovely point. That they came to break the bread and remember the Lord at that time in the morning when he rose from the dead. And then they were worshipping the Lord. Now, I only went once there. They never asked me back. But it must have been a learning church. And we need to be a learning church. And do things that will not grieve the Holy Spirit, but do things as God wants us to do them. And maybe that's the reason we're not reaching people, because we're not willing to learn. Now another thing, it was a social church, a fellowship church. Now I remember when I became a Christian, my social life was affected with the church, was associated with it. I went there all the time. And it was like my social life as well as my spiritual life because there are different things happening. It was a fellowship church as well as a learning church. Now that's some of the characteristics of this first church. It was a praying church. They prayed, and God answered the prayers. Now let me tell you this, which some of you might not know, because it was even before I was converted. In 1948, there was a revival in the Hebrides, and it was because two ladies, now I don't know what age they were, were praying. And they prayed that God would bless the Hebrides, storm away. Now, Duncan Campbell was the principal of the Faith College in Edinburgh. And when they have a conference in Scotland, they don't have one speaker. They have three speakers. Two in the afternoon and one in the evening. And he was sitting on the platform. The second speaker. And the first speaker was holding forth. And the Lord said, leave, go to Stornoway. And he thought, Lord, I'm the next speaker. That's what Duncan Campbell said. So he had to excuse himself and get the plane from Edinburgh to Stornoway. And the minute he arrived in Stornoway, the revival broke out. Now, that was obedience. I don't know whether the third speaker took the second pe person's place. I don't know. But that was what happened. And that was a revival. The last revival we've had in this country. Now it was a praying church. There were two people praying. And God heard them. It said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of you. And when God tells us to do something, we need to do it. Now, I'm sure he had an excuse as long as his arm, he couldn't go. But he went. And it was obedience. And God always honors obedience. Now, it was a reverent church. So it was a learning church, a fellowship church, where there was real fellowship, one with another, a praying church, and it was a reverent church. It tells us in the Bible that 
all came upon the church. It said, all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. People realized something of the fear of the Lord. God was working in these people who had never been to university, who had never been to college. They were fishermen, Galileans, and there they were, speaking, allowing the Holy Spirit to use them as a channel of blessing to many, many people. So it was a reverent church. It was a church where things happen. Now, when anything happens, the crowd starts to come. I remember years ago, somebody got saved, and the next night, there were loads of people more because they wanted to see. They might have been nosy, I don't know, but they wanted to see something that was happening. And also, it was a church which shared it was a sharing church now we're living in a day when people are poor and many people are on benefits but they didn't have any benefits then and folk who had more than they needed sold their goods and gave it to the poor and everybody their needs were satisfied so it was a sharing church now I don't know about you but the last two churches I've been in had a poor fund now you might say well I've never heard about it they had a poor fund because at one of the churches there was children who came to the children's meeting and they said, well, I didn't have any breakfast today because the cornflakes were finished. It's my turn tomorrow. And they only got fed when they had a gyro sent to them. And we had a poor fund in that church. Now that church also money had been laid aside so that people when they got bills that they couldn't pay like the gas or the electricity bill which was so enormous they couldn't afford it and help was given there the second church I was in which had a poor fund they actually one man had a bill from the income tax he had a business a small business and he thought, how am I going to pay this bill? Now, you know how somebody has said, if you pay what's right, you've nothing left. That's what they say about tax. But this man was paying what was right, but he didn't have the cash to pay the income tax. And the church in this fund lent him some money, which he paid back to the poor fund. So it was a sharing church. Now, I don't know the needs of everybody. But I know some people have a hard struggle. I know some people have got more than what they need. And I just thank the Lord that he's a God who cares for each one of us. That we need to be a sharing church. This church was... Not only a sharing church, but a worshipping church. They worshipped all the time at the temple. From house to house they broke bread. They were a worshipping church. They worshipped the Lord. They didn't have to wait till the weekend. Now when you go up Station Hill, there's a Pentecostal church there. And it says on the wall, a happy church. That's what it says on the wall. Now that's right. This should be a happy church. 
the early church was a happy church. They saw things happening. They worshipped the Lord. Their needs were provided daily. And that's why the apostle said, we won't give ourselves to that. We'll give ourselves to the word of God and prayer. That's what they did. They were full of joy. And when the Lord comes and changes a person's life, there's joy. We belong to him. We've been set free from the bondage we were in. We're a happy church. Now, today, we need to be a, a happy church. I read to you about a learning church, a fellowship church, a church where we were in fellowship. Not just saying hello and good night, but real fellowship. A praying church. We need to pray. And when people see our life is different, we're a reverent church. Our life is different. Our language is different. We are different. And it's a church where things happen. And also a sharing church. A worshipping church. And a happy church. That's some of the characteristics of the church at Pentecost. Look how far we have been removed from that situation. Now, Peter, he says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God and of glory. He's the Spirit of God and of glory. He's the Lord, the Spirit. And it's Peter who tells us in the fourth chapter of Peter, verse 14, that the Spirit is the Spirit of God and of glory. Now tonight, I pray regularly that God will affect everybody in this church. That God will bless 4th Street because of the, the people who are here. And they can take you. They can take me and use us. But we've got to be obedient. We've got to be willing to learn, to obey him and to serve him. So that was some of the characteristics of the early church. And I'm sure there's much more in this chapter and as we think of what God has done in our lives and all the people who don't know the Lord are going to be experience that fire, the baptism of fire because they're unrepentant. Tonight, let's ask the Lord to help us that we might be effective in our service for him. Now we're just going to close in the prayer. Father we thank you. That we have in, on our, in our Bibles. The record of how the church began. Lord we have wandered. We have come so far along the line. And we want to be effective in our generation. Lord when we see the world in such a mess and how the Lord Jesus suffered for every one of them if they'll only come and receive salvation oh Lord help us we pray and help us that we might see many people in our own families and our friends becoming followers of the Lord Jesus Christ Lord hear our prayer be with us this night and help us to learn and grow in your knowledge and in your grace. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing our closing hymn, which is 673. 
673. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. That's 673. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sin, the slain. Thank you, oh, my Father, for giving <coughs> in your spirit till the work of God. When I stand in glory, I will see his face, and there I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son, and lead in your spirit till the work on earth is done. Let's remain standing for our closing prayer. Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus came and the Holy Spirit indwells your people. Lord, we thank you for every blessing that we have in him. Now may the grace of our Lord be with each one of us and our loved ones, for Jesus' sake. Amen.